pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll start with a kind of personal confession, which is that I'm not a Eurosceptic. I continue to believe in the value of European integration, but I do have a number of criticisms about what has happened. Um, many, many years ago, when the world was young, I went to the College of Europe in 1962-63, and that gave me, I think, a very strong insight into what was driving European integration. It was seen as an unrelieved good. In every possible way, European integration was a good thing. It was, shall we say, ideologically a committed um, way of introducing me to European integration. And, of course, some of it was a very valid technical, uh, I followed the course of European law, the European sociology, so uh, I learned a great deal from it and obviously made contacts with people I still see. Uh, we are no longer quite as young and quite so enthusiastic, but that goes with the territory. So what I want to do today, uh, I'll take my watch off so that I have some idea of what I am. What I want to do today is to look at the beginnings of it all in mean, a very general way. Why? Why integrate? I mean, why not just go on the way in which things were um, before the First World War, in the interwar period, and so on? Uh, what were the impulses that led the founding fathers and their wives, they weren't really founding mothers, um, to say, OK, we've got to change something? Um, and here I think um, there were two things. First of all, the devastation of the war. I'm just old enough to remember this. Um, and the trauma that went with it. Not just the physical destruction. And have a look at the pictures of how Germany looked. Or indeed, have a look at the pictures of what Budapest looked like in, well, uh, 4th of March, 1945, the day of liberation, Budapest. Um, Devastating, but also the human dimension of it. Very large numbers of people dead, wounded, missing, chaos, massive population movements. It absolutely qualifies, uh, in my view, as a cultural trauma. And I'll say something about that in a moment. The other dimension, of course, a realization that the end of the First World War, which was not very long. Previous to that, it was followed by the Paris Peace Settlement, and the Paris Peace Settlement was a miserable failure. I'm not merely saying this from the Hungarian perspective, Trian, and obviously with Trian is going to be coming out of every tap um, for a while now. Uh, so those of you who don't know about it will certainly be much better informed. Um, but overall, I mean, the French, who in a way dominated the Paris Peace Settlement, constructed a security system that failed. Failed miserably. The security system was to keep Germany, Austria, Hungary down and France up. And it didn't work. You know, what the French could achieve uh, in 1918, um, they certainly couldn't sustain, partly because of the world crisis uh, of the late 1920s, early 30s, France was badly. And then second, there's the re-emergence of Germany as a major European power, economically and then gradually politically. That would have happened whether there had been a Nazi takeover or not. Uh, there's no way that Germany would have remained. Uh, basically, the, I don't want to exaggerate this, but there was a kind of political vacuum in the 1920s where Germany was. And that, that would have changed whatever. It's fate that Germany re-emerged uh, as a Nazi state and, well, you know the rest, um, Second World War and so on and so forth. Um, we can talk about that some other time. So 1945, uh, and this I think is a highly original moment when there's a realization on the part of leading European politicians coming out of the ruins saying, OK, look, a Paris Peace Settlement failed. We are going to rebuild Europe. We've got to come out of the trauma. 
Um, but we are not going to do it the way in which it was done in 1918, in other words, by excluding Germany. Once you take that decision, a number of things fall into place, which is, okay, you're going to have a Europe in which there will be a Germany a recognition that Germany will always be a major power in Europe. How do you create uh, limits on that power? Um, and this, I think, is where the originality of the integration method uh, becomes uh, clear, that you create, I call it a, an instrument, because that's the Brussels language, a procedure, basically having a supra-state entity that has the power to command the states who sign up to this. This is originally called the high authority, called the steel community. This is the original idea that you create this body which controls the French, German, Luxembourg, Belgium, tiny Dutch. I'm not sure if the Italians actually had. They probably had, yes, they must have had steel industry, but I don't think they had coal. Um, and this high authority says, actually, this is now a common European legal, political, economic entity. Why those two areas? Because huh, these are the sinews of war, as understood in 1914, or something like that. How things have changed. Coal and steel, of course, are now no longer terribly important. Other things are. Uh, but the idea is there. Um, and then, I don't want to give you a plotted history of European integration, but I think a uh, key moment, there are two key moments, well, three key moments. Um, is the founding fathers, who are all, with one exception, Christian Democrat, um, obviously Robert Schumann, who starts his career as a German because he's from Lyon before 1914, uh, uh, Adelaide, Alcide Gasperi, who starts his career as an Italian in Vienna. So they all have this multinational experience. Um, and the Christian Democrat element is there. Don't underestimate it. I think it's weak now, but I think in the early years it really did count. And then the other figure, other two figures who are enormously important are Jean Monnet. Jean Monnet, he spent the war years in Washington organizing, he was an organizer. Technocrat, and he said, okay, fine. We were, and I think the idea of this supra state uh, body, which became the high authority, was very much down to him. Um, and he said, okay, we've got to organize it, let's do it, that's the way it has to be done. And the other figure, who I think shouldn't be underestimated, although he tends to be written out of the mainstream story, uh, is Altero Spinelli. Spinelli was very left wing, and he was an utterly convinced federalists. The only way in which Europe was actually worth having is as a federal Europe. Um, he did, was a member of Europe, he was a commissioner at one time, was a, certainly a member of the European Parliament, a communist, but actually he was, certainly was on the left, but I would say he was a federalist. I think that was the thing that drove him. Um, and so that's the second key moment. The next key moment, which I will simply mention, is beginning of 1963, the Gaul vetoes British entry. Uh, I was at the College of Europe at that time, so I have vivid personal memories. The general says no, no to the Anglo-Saxons, and that was the language he used. Um, so basically Europe at that point remains Europe of the six the founding members. Um, and then the next key moment, which I think <coughs> is underestimated, um, is the empty chair. The then president of the commission, Walter Hallstein, uh, moves, tries to move Europe very radically in a federal direction. Um, and the French say no. Uh, and the other five, are prepared to go along with this. And the French say no, and they leave Brussels. This is the empty chair period. But then eventually, 
I mean, who is the go-between between the French and the rest of them? Luxembourg. Uh, Luxembourg is very interesting because Luxembourgish is a dialect of German, but actually they all grew up speaking French. Um, so, you know, they are the perfect go-betweens. And they do a deal. The French will come back, but if a really serious member state and national interest is affected, um, then, okay, they will pay attention to that. What this proves to me, and I think that's still true, uh, is that for anything to change in the integration <coughs> process, there has to be the political will. Um, and indeed, uh, I think that's still true to this very day, and I'll come on to this in a little while, what's happening at this present time. Um, the process goes on, so 73, uh, the United Kingdom, Ireland, and Denmark are admitted, Norway votes no, um, Sweden doesn't consider it, Sweden is a neutral state, doesn't consider it, Finns of course, no way that they could do it, Austria likewise. So then you have the next uh, enlargement, which is Greece, and this is premature. Uh, Greece wasn't ready for membership. And I remember talking to Max von der Stuhl, who was Dutch for the minister at the time. He was a high commissioner for national minorities in his later days, and I got to know him reasonably well. And I said to him, don't you think that Greece was given membership too early? And in his very sort of stiff, formal Dutch way, he said, thought for a while and said, yes. He didn't specify. So, it was important in the aftermath of, uh, well, Karabalis, obviously, the collapse of the colonel's regime, to integrate Euro uh, Greece into Europe in order to safeguard Greek democracy. And that, of course, plays to Europe's antecedents and classical Greece, Athenian democracy, and so on, the, the mythic element of European integration. Uh, then you have Spain and Portugal, uh, 87 or 88 uh, membership, um, the next integration is after the Cold War, Austria, Sweden and Finland, and then the Big Bang, 2004, which is where we come in. Um, and in a way, I think, in retrospect, um, I don't think I saw it quite this way in 2004 when I was elected to the European Parliament. This has been the most difficult and large one, not just because it's the biggest. And by the way, the original uh, members were followed by Romania, Bulgaria, and then by Croatia, and uh, don't hold your breath for the next enlargement. Um, many years, I would say, Montenegro, Serbia, I don't know, if at all, 27, maybe later, who knows. Um, certainly the French and the Dutch are vetoing further enlargement at this time. Hungary is very much in favour. The V for the Visegrad countries are in favour. I'd put my money on the French if I were you. Uh, I have a feeling that their political weight outdoes that of the Visegrad countries, but we will see. So, at that point, I think, um, there were a series of misunderstandings, misperceptions between the older members and the new members. Now, we were referred to as new members for a very long time. So much so that after 10 years, I think one of my Hungarian colleagues said, a pair of shoes is not new after 10 years, but a member state clearly is. When will this end? Well, I think it's sort of ended, but that it, semiotic terms we are not new members, but in real terms, there really are differences uh, between how different orchestra say them, how how we see, especially the Visegrad countries, uh, enlargement and our membership of the European Union, what kind of Europe we want to see, and what is happening in Brussels. Now again, I don't want to homogenize this because I think in reality although the people who are loudest and most to be heard are the Federalists, 
But in fact, I think in most European countries there are people who, shall we say, have misgivings about integration for its own sake. And this, I think, has become one of the major cleavage lines in Europe. Is integration inherently good? Well, why? Why is further integration good without further questioning? Shouldn't we ask, well, why are we integrating? What's it for? And if I ask questions like this, they say, you're a terrible Eurosceptic. And I say, no, I'm not Eurosceptic, I'm a Eurocritical. At that point, they usually stop, but if they didn't stop, they would say, there isn't such a category. Eurocriticism is Euroscepticism. Well, I don't agree with this, obviously. Um, and then and the question is, I say, well, why does the integration begin? And the answer I'm giving you, put it in a nutshell, is conflict resolution. And between 1948, <coughs> let's say, or whatever date, start date you want to give it, the uh, Coal of Steel community comes into being in 51, but I think the idea is, oh, if you want a symbolic date, it's the Hague Congress of 1948. Um, I'm not old enough to have been there. Well, I suppose I could have been, but I was very young. Um, and the idea is, how do you prevent further conflict? And how do you resolve conflict? Obviously, uh, it's been immensely successful in the sense there's been no war in Europe. That part of Europe, I think, you know, the wars of Yugoslav succession, it was a terrible shock for Brussels that this could still happen. But basically, if you think about it, in 1945, there were people alive who'd lived through three Franco-German wars. Franco-Prussian War, two world wars. Well, no war now, which means inconceivable between France and Germany. It doesn't mean they agree on everything, but there are instruments, procedures, methods for sitting down and talking through the problems. And this, I think, is actually at the heart of it, that all the actors are ready to make some concessions. This is getting weaker. Uh, it's not as strong as it was 50 years ago. It's <coughs> even as strong as it was 30 years ago. Um, and increasingly, I believe, we are seeing stronger emphasis on the member state interest. Now, this is a, a classic symbolic case, and I don't want to put too much weight on it, but it does illustrate it. I imagine you all know that the European Parliament sits in Brussels, but actually also sits in Strasbourg. Strasbourg and Brussels are a long way from one another. It's not a tram journey. Um, so, once a month, the European Parliament packs up uh, hundreds of boxes, thousands of people, papers, whatever. Yes, we may be living in a digital world, but we don't have a paperless Parliament. We're working on it. And we all transfer ourselves to Strasbourg. And I can tell you, I haven't done this for 15 years, Strasbourg is a lovely town. It's just hell to get to. You have an airport with virtually no flights. It's not quite a white elephant. Uh, the flights to Paris, there used to be a lot more. All the flights to Paris, I think the three a day, go to Orly. That's domestic. So if you want to go from Strasbourg to anywhere else, you don't go through Paris. How do you travel well? Frankfurt. So, I've spent a great deal of my life at Frankfurt Airport. I know Frankfurt Airport intimately. We're on very good terms. Uh, one day a plaque will go up with Joe Shoplin sat here. Uh, who knows? But the, the madness of it uh, in this day and age of environmental footprint and whatever is that this move, uh, month, 12 a year, uh, costs somewhere in excess of 200 billion euros a year. And who pays it? All European citizens. I think the French should pay for it, don't you? I think if, were, if France were told, from now on you pay for Strasbourg, they might just be a little keener to say, oh, well, okay, maybe not 12 a year, but it's not happening. And certainly my French colleagues that 
I talk to, um, I said, I'm not, it's a question of national interest. I said, but why? I said, well, it, it's about Europe. This is Franco-German reconciliation. And I said, but can't you be pragmatic about it? But the French are not pragmatic, as you well know. So the answer is national interest counts. This is a particularly egregious case, but a lot of other cases. And some of it is highly technical. Um, one of my early experiences was voting through the chemicals directive. <coughs> I have no idea what it was about, but it lasted three hours. Can you imagine you're sitting there pushing your button three hours with no idea what you're doing? That was me. It was very early in my parliamentary career, I think in 2005. Um, so I mentioned that um, being a member of the European Parliament has its uh, extremely tedious moments. That was one of them. Um, but all this raises the question of, well, if the member state interest is now becoming more and more important, which I think is the case, how do you resolve the conflict, the friction? The, the, I mean, my position on this is that wherever there are human communities, there will always be conflict. There's nothing inherently wrong with conflict. It's how you solve it, which is not invariably easy. Um, can you get two actors to sit down and say, let's we'll split it down the middle, okay? You give me that, I'll give you that, and then there's that thing coming up in six months' time, and we'll have a deal on that. And, Maybe the third party will come in, etc. etc. I mean, it gets very, very complex. But let me add, it's very boring. Committees sitting, having long conversations, of often of a very, very technical nature. So that never gets reported in the media. In fact, I really don't see how the electronic media or the print media could actually report any of this because they are, how shall I put it politely? Uh, Journalists, media workers are into adversarialism. They like to see black and white. They like to simplify it radically. Um, you all know who I mean by Farid Zafariya, American commentator. He got it right. <coughs> what journalism does, you simplify and then you exaggerate. This is correct. This is what happens. So the media actually or a snare and a delusion. They don't tell you what is happening. They tell you what the journalists think you want to know. It is possible to keep track of what's going on in Brussels. Um, one of the best sources available only to those who know Hungarian is Brooks Info. Uh, very, very good. Um, and then you, know, you have specialized technical EU observer, you can look at it as a paywall. Um, you're active. I mean, it is possible to keep track. But uh, this is not so true of Books Info, but most of these websites are either hard or soft federalists. They think that integration is a good thing. That's basically uh, what their attitude is. So we now have this situation where I believe that the European interest, which is not easy to define, is in conflict, I think, increasingly with the member state interest. And here is where, I'm going to call them the new member states, but I'm, no, I'm going to call them the EU 11. So that's the Visegrad country, the three Baltic states, Croatia, Romania, and Bulgaria, Slovenia, I don't think I've left anybody out. Um, they are not a cohesive group, let me add. They do have differences among themselves. And it's very clear from my knowledge of the Baltic states that the Baltic states will not make trouble because they expect the European Union to protect them from Russia. The Polish attitude to Russia is one of deep suspicion. The Hungarian attitude to Russia is quite pragmatic. We pretend to be in good terms, but actually it's all about energy. Um, why is it all about energy? Well, we don't have a seacoast. We can't build an LNG terminal. I don't think the Croats will give us back uh, Rijeka. Uh, there's not enough space there anyway, so we need a lot of space. And then 
There were these ideas way back, 2007, I think I heard the discussion. Croatia is going to build an LNG terminal in Kirk. Nothing. Um, about a year ago, the, pres the present Prime Minister of Croatia, Andrei Plenković, who happened to have been a colleague of mine, so I got to know him quite well, um, came to uh, Strasbourg, I think, um, talked to the EPP group, which he was a member, and I was a member, and I said to him, Andrei, are you going to build this terminal, the Kirk? And are you going to build the interconnectors between the coastline and Hungary? And he said, well, um, we're working on it. We've still got legislation to pass. And I thought to myself, I mean, come on, you know, this starts in 2005, 2006, nothing. So where do we get our fossil fuels? Pipelines from Russia. There are pipelines from Baumgart near Austria. But we're not a, an energy island, but we are dependent. Uh, and then, I'm not sure what is happening with the big field in the Black Sea. Perhaps the Romanians will complete the interconnectors, perhaps they won't. So, you know, we're dependent. Uh, unless, of course, we discover massive gas fields in Hungary or whatever. Uh, so, basically what I'm saying is that state-national differences structure a great deal in the European Union. There are Hungarian positions, which are nobody else's. There are Baltic positions, which are uniquely theirs, and so on and so forth. So obviously, the potential for conflict remains. And this is where I see a serious problem. The serious problem is that if you are a committed federalist, then that overrides the conflict resolution. And this has certainly been my experience, that if you believe from this, if you start from this moral uh, imperative position that federalism is good and no one may question that, then it becomes very difficult to say, well, we have a problem here, how can we resolve it, how can we use the technical to satisfy um, the solution in such a way that everybody gets something, because that's overridden by the morality. Uh, and at that point, I fear we are back into a world of ideologies. Um, will, most of you will know Daniel Bell's book, The End of Ideology. No, ideology is not over. Ideology remains in being, um, and it does, it does drive people. Um, if you like, belief in good, the good life, to some degree ideological. Liberalism is absolutely an ideology, but if it's your ideology, you think this is the right thing to do. If it's not your ideology, then of course you see it as an ideology, so it's a contingency. Uh, but if you're inside a belief system, you don't want to accept your own contingency, because you know that you're right, and they're wrong. And it's this problem of once you introduce right and wrong into this integration process, it becomes much more difficult which I think is what is happening now, to get there on an ongoing basis. Now, I've got a few more things to say. Yeah. Um, I mentioned the end of the Cold War. I think I mentioned the word globalization. The two obviously go together. I think the end of the Cold War accelerates a pre-existing process. And I think we all have our own idea of what globalization is. So I'm going to give you mine. I realize it's not the entirety of it. But what I see globalization as having um, achieved, intentionally, is that prior to this arbitrary date, and it is an arbitrary date of 1989, uh, end of the Cold War, uh, this modern state the Weberian legal rational state was largely able to maintain legal rationality, linear processes. And there were non-linear processes, but they could be managed. They could be kept down, if you like. Which also meant, that's another technical term from systems theory, 
wicked problems could be managed. <coughs> wicked problem is not a moral condemnation. I don't know why they're called wicked problems, but that's a technical term. Um, there are insoluble problems. If you're a liberal, you may not believe that, but think about it. Health provision. The demand for health provision will always outrun supply. It can never be solved. So what do you do? Well, you ration health care. You ration it by time, keep people in a queue, or by money. If you've got money, you can buy health care. <coughs> I think that's the American solution. The European solution is a mixture. I'm very impressed by the French health system, by the way. Uh, it's, you do pay something, it's not expensive, and it's very effective. I've had occasion to deal with the Belgian health system likewise. Uh, British National Health Service, which is free, the point of usage, is fine if it's something serious and urgent. They will operate on you immediately. If it's a cold case, well, get in the back of the queue. So if you want a hip replacement, don't go to the National Health Service. It takes a long time. Um, so what I'm getting at is that because globalization uh, made it possible for new sites of power to impact on Europe and the United States, China is the most obvious case. Um, this is, I think, an unintended consequence of the Washington consensus. Basically, making money is good, and if you make money, you'll be peaceful. This is complete nonsense. Uh, if you want a, a really interesting instance of it, look at Azerbaijan, which happens to be sitting on immense quantities of oil and gas. So they become very rich. Uh, it's the resource curse. I found Baku absolutely fascinating. I want to visit there. Um, <clears throat> and what did they spend their money on? They've built a really fantastic army because they've got this problem with Armenia. So there's wealth make you peaceful? No, I don't think it does. Um, there's other things which readiness uh, to solve problems uh, through consensus, but it takes us off in a different direction. So what I'm getting at is that globalization um, has given rise to unmanageable, non-linear processes. This is the complexity problem. Um, how do you deal with a multi-actor uh, situation in which there are too many divergences and, above all, unintended consequences? Historically, the state could broadly manage this. That's the Weberian state. Uh, you have a functioning, legal, rational bureaucracy which is not interfered with all that much by arbitrary power. It's not bad, you know, we can do this. Um, and to some degree, the European Union bureaucracy was doing this. There's an expectation that every European member state, EU member state, runs a bureaucracy of this kind, and there's consistency over time. <coughs> and the problem is that this consistency, it's, it's not fragmenting, but I think it is eroding. There are too many cases of one particular kind of treatment for one member state and another particular kind of treatment for another member state. I'll give you one Hungarian and non-Hungarian example. 2010, Fidesz wins the elections, discovers there's a massive deficit. Um, and Orban goes to see the president of the commission, Barroso, and says, look, uh, we know we have to keep our budget within a 3% deficit. Can we have an easy? And Barroso says no. Some years later, S Spain says we have a serious deficit problem. Could we have an easy? Yes. France, um, this was I think last year, but it may have been the year before that, again had some kind of a deficit problem. They went to Juncker and he said, oh, but of course, mais certainement. And when asked why, he said, because France is France. Isn't that a wonderful answer? I mean, why? Well, you know, because. Uh, so, dif differential treatment. Now, that does not go down very well, understandably. 
I don't just say this as a Hungarian, I say this in politics. Um, if one country gets better treatment, there are a lot for no particular reason. Well, power, maybe, uh, prestige, maybe there's a particular deal, and so on and so forth. So at that point, I think that the non-linear processes make the situation worse, because they're not seen as non-linear processes, but they're seen as somebody being troublesome. And here I think we're getting to a new state of affairs, which I sort of saw, but I'm not sure if I was able to formulate it now, but now that I'm no longer in Brussels, I have the time and the distance, I think I see it better, which is uh, the consensual approach to conflict resolution is weakening. I'm not saying it's disappeared. But increasingly, there is pressure. There's the emergence of a coercive quality to the European Union, or simply ignoring problems. Um, how many of you know about the Croatian Slovenian frontier dispute? You know about it? Well, what's the European Union doing about it? Hmm? 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 What? Croatian frontier? Hmm? Hmm? Eh? No? It's about 600 meters of seacoast. Nothing. That's sort of shuffled off to a committee. If, it, if ever there was a conflict, why isn't the European Union doing more about it? Um, I'm a little biased, but I really do think that the sentence is handed down on these Catalan is a little excessive. Um, some of mine are personally, they were colleagues of my own. I'm neutral on whether or not Catalonia uh, should have the right to secede, uh, but giving 13 years to somebody who was active politically <coughs> in or your Jean Carrey, as I say, I do know personally, it's a bit too much. Uh, I, you know, I, I find that a, difficult, a little difficult to swallow. And let me add, Brussels has not said a single word about Catalonia. Total silence. Here's a really serious dispute. Nothing. Not a word. Um, the only thing it said about Scotland is, well, if Scotland doesn't come independent, then it will have to join the queue. Uh, but also said that. Uh, but that was really, I think, he said that for the benefit of Madrid. I think if Scotland does become independent, and it may happen, I think actually it will be able to join fairly easily. I will say a little bit about Brexit in a moment. I can't resist the Brexit story. So, if we're looking at this, this problem, um, the linear, non-linear uh, processes, I can see that uh, these are beginning to affect the institution, institutional structure of the European Union itself. And here we come up against a very, very interesting, I'm not sure whether it's a dilemma or a wicked problem or what to call it, that if you accept my argument that historically the European Union has really been quite good at solving problems, conflict resolution, it doesn't actually have the instruments for solving conflict within itself. And this is the new parliament, the one I don't know personally, that I see, um, that there's a very serious set of conflicts between, with at least three actors, but actually many more, between council, <coughs> member states, parliament, and commission. We're in the middle of this. I don't want to predict, well, maybe just a little, um, but speaking as of today, 15th of October, and Hungarians, of course, will know what is the anniversary of 1944, um, but that's not what I want to talk about. Um, I can see a scenario where the Fondalan Commission will be voted down. Possible. Outcome, a major constitutional crisis in the European Union. Nobody knows. I mean, that's the point about uh, non-linear processes. You can't foresee them and you don't know which way uh, it will splatter. Uh, why am I saying this? Well, this is a very angry parliament. Uh, and it's become very unpredictable. Now, if you want evidence for that, um, I don't know if any of you saw this short video with Macron uh, talking about uh, the non 
election of Sylvie Goulard uh, as French commissioner, he was irritable, angry, nervous, but clearly he didn't understand because he thought he'd done a deal. Apparently, so my Brussels insider friends tell me, uh, von der Leyen and Goulard are good friends. They were both ministers of defence. Uh, they both have similar backgrounds, they're all the same age, and it was von der Leyen who asked Macron to send Sylvie Goulard as the commission. Well, her record was not completely spotless, and given his great fit of uh, moral cleansing that it was done, I think captured the Greens and to some extent the Liberals, um, she wasn't a very good choice. Uh, I didn't, she, was a, she was a member of the European Parliament, I didn't know her very well. Um, I remember her as being sort of forthright and tough, which may not be the best quality when you're being uh, being at a, a commissioner hearing. Um, also, the portfolio she was given was impossible. It's an enormous portfolio. And basically, what seems to have happened is that Macron had, and von der Leyen thought, OK, they've fixed the deal with the various party groups in Parliament, and that will sort of slide through. Well, no, it didn't happen. Uh, and here, I think, again, we have a cascade, a series of events coming one on top of the other. The Greens were always going to vote against her, it was quite clear, partly because, well, she accepted a monthly 13,000 euros as a consultant from an American think tank. That's not bad, not bad money if you can get it. Um, there was some problem about the way in which some of the money she paid her assistants actually ended up financing something in France. She was so dubious. Um, so the Greek robbers are going to vote against her. Um, the EPP, which everybody thought had been fixed, I mean, the EPP apparently went to the Liberals, the Renew Europe, as they now call themselves, and said, Look, if you don't vote against the Hungarian candidate, we won't vote against the Liberal candidate. And the Liberals said, absolutely not. We will never do a deal with you. Look, it's a DPP, fine, right. We understand your position. So the DPP voted against Goulart because there's no deal. I think some of the socialists also voted against Goulart because she's a free market person, she's a neoliberal. So some of the social democrats said this is not acceptable. I really can't see the far left voting for her. So what was the vote in this committee? 83-29. This is a miserable failure. And Macron, who thought that he had done a deal, and the Lyon thought that she'd done a deal, actually it turns out that there's an uncontrollable parliament. It's a parliament that doesn't do deals that doesn't do deals. Ooh, we're in very dangerous territory here. What kind of politics is it? Well, the politics of confrontation. Uh, which is why I'm saying that I can see this scenario where at some point, it's not going to be soon, uh, the entire, well, the entire college of commissioners goes before parliament and parliament says, no. I say it's not going to happen soon because in the interim, as I expect you know, there's a crisis, a government crisis in Romania. So the Romanian commissioner candidate, Ravana Plum, who again, a former colleague of mine, I never met her, uh, was voted down. Um, so Romania has to send a new, a new commissioner designate, but there's no government, so catch-22. Don't know what's going to happen. I think, uh, the, as I understand it, at 5 o'clock, uh, Eucharist time, the new government will be announced. Who he too will be called Orban, also I'm given to understand. Well, I think his father was actually called Orban, but let that be. Uh, he's half Hungarian, half Romanian. Um, and by the way, speaks very good Hungarian. Um, and maybe then they will find the commissioner candidate. Um, it's muddied, made more difficult by the fact that. Uh, von der Leyen is saying there must be more women, absolutely fine, but then can you find the woman who you actually want to see, etc., etc. So, in the interim, as you know, Tor Chani, the Hungarian commissioner candidate, 
has rooted out. We've provisionally put forward the permanent representative, Bahe, who is a technocrat, who I knew reasonably well, actually. Um, but he hasn't received his official papers because nothing can happen until both Romanians and the French put forward the commissioner candidate. So nothing will happen in October. So when? Well, well, I don't know. Watch this space. It's up in the air. It's never been quite so bad, I think. And I think there's a really major conflict now among the three institutions. And as I say, there is no established conflict resolution mechanism. How do you do it? Because I think what it's about, and I'll get a little technical here, uh, those of you who know will recognize that I'm referring to Carl Schmidt, who is the sovereign. I don't know. Who is the sovereign in the European Union? Who is the one who can make the exception? I don't know. Uh, member states think, council, they are. Parliament says, no, we are an elected democratic parliament, but we're not fully sovereign, but, you know, we have a lot of powers. We are co legislating Commissioner, commission, on the other hand, has all sorts of powers. How do you resolve this? Well, worst comes to the worst, could be taken to the Luxembourg court. They hate it. But in a way, I understand their position that courts do not like to decide political conflicts. That's not what they're there for. Uh, and I can't quite see how this can go to Luxembourg, but I don't know what the legal issue is. Well, maybe if you look at the treaty, uh, treaty on the European Union, Article 4, Section 2, correct me, it's something about sincere cooperation. Not much sincerity, not much cooperation. So, uh, here we are. Um, we're, in, we're in trouble as far as European integration is concerned because I think we've lost sight. And I think when I say we, I mean all member states. The United Kingdom is still a member state, technically, legally, politically, no. So I'll say two more things and then I'll stop. Uh, one other point I want to make, um, I don't know if any of you know, know the name of Branko Milanovic. He's a, a Serbian-American, he's from Belgrade, but he's working in the US. Um, he has some very interesting, as an economist, which I'm not, but it's, uh, I'm taking this second hand, there's some very interesting things to say that the, in the economic inequality between the Western states, the EU 14 and the EU 11, was too big to be integrated into a single market. In other words, the only way you could do it is either have massive transfers of money, which of course is what happened in Spain and Portugal. Have you all been to Spain, all these motorways built there with EU money? You know, as far as I recall, not a single kilometre of TGV high-speed train has been built in any of the EU 11. I think the first will be the real Baltica from Tallinn to Kaunas, eventually to Warsaw. 600 kilometres, 22, no, I think 23, 24. It'll be wonderful, I'll be able to get a train from Tallinn and go to Kaunas. Three hours. What do I do in Kaunas? Well, maybe by that time the link to Warsaw will be. Of course, in Warsaw you can go to Berlin and anyway. But the point, political point I'm making is that there has been no great transfer of money from the richer countries to the poorer countries. And if you look at um, the list of GDP per capita, with one exception, the list is exactly the same in 2004 as it is in 2018. In other words, I think Austria is at the top, Italy is somewhere in the middle, um, and then you get, Italy is about 100, um, and then you go below the 100. Um, then the list changes a bit because we've all, I think apart from Romania, Bulgaria, we've all overtaken Greece. Greece is a catastrophe, it's a disaster, you know. I can only say it's just terrible, uh, miserable. Um, so, for that reason, I think Hungary has pulled ahead. 
uh, Estonia is ahead of Hungary, Slovakia is ahead of Hungary, and the Czech Republic and Slovenia. And I think they're coming close to overtaking Portugal. But apart from that, that ranking order has not changed. In other words, EU membership has conserved the inequality. That's not very good, because that wasn't the promise of catching up. But in a way, we all lived with it in the early 90s. Uh, that creates friction, that creates problems. Lastly, Brexit. Well, I don't know, is what I want to say about Brexit. I think it's, maybe it's a wicked problem and it's insoluble. Maybe, uh, you know, if you've been following this, you'll know this, uh, they're in the tunnel. Tunnel, in this instance, is a metaphor. It's not a literal physical tunnel, they haven't gone underground. Um, but they're basically talking absolutely behind closed doors, no leaks, and trying to work out something to be ready by Thursday, because there's a summit meeting on Thursday. And anyway, if nothing is worked out, the United Kingdom disappears as a member of the European Union on the 31st of October. Well, perhaps I should add a little footnote here that I'm an interested party, I'm not only because I lived in the United Kingdom for many years, but I receive a British pension. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth less and less, because sterling is sort of declining. And, uh, so I'm not open about this. Um, besides, uh, it's difficult enough to travel to the United Kingdom even now. It will be even worse, because they there's a, a current which is so hostile now to the, to the continent. Um, I've had countless stories of people being shouted at because they dared to speak an unintelligible language. Oxford Street is safe. If you speak Hungarian in Oxford Street, that's fine. But if you go to a pub, maybe not. Maybe not speak Hungarian or Polish or <laughs> Lithuanian or whatever. Um, it's very strange, uh, in a way, because there is an English identity, not a British identity, trying to find its way to the surface. Parts of it are quite xenophobic. Um, and it's not altogether pretty. So, the other, I don't know what's going to happen, but what is very clear, this again is to you can link this up with what I said earlier about complexity theory, um, and polarization. Uh, I went to London with one of my committees, the Constitutional Committee, this would be I think, three years ago, it was before the referendum, so actually it's more. And talking to various Eurosceptics, and perhaps the Sir Bill Cash, his name means something to you. Very nice man. Um, speaks very good French. Utterly hostile to the European Union. I mean, an English nationalist, very able, hates the place. Or well, he's possibly the type that says, love Europe, hate the EU. And again, it's quite an interesting position. And uh, I remember Bill saying, whatever it costs, we want out. Now, you can't negotiate with an attitude like that. Uh, and that, I think, has been the problem. Lots of other things. So, I think my time's up, isn't it? Well, done an hour. If you can, it's just a very dark. Yeah. So, let me thank you all for listening to me. And if, if there are questions, I'll try and answer them.